All right, so uh, welcome to everybody. For the so many of you are probably familiar with Ralph Bradley, but I, ass I assume not everybody. So let me briefly introduce Ralph Bradley to you. Um, so he was born in uh, November of 1923 in uh, Smith Falls, Ontario, in Canada, and he grew up in Canada. He graduated from Queen's University in 1944 with an honors degree in mathematics and physics, and then served in the Canadian Army from 1944 to 1945, after which he completed an MA degree at Queen's in 1946. Uh, he received his PhD from the uh, University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill in 1949 and went on to a very distinguished career, uh, which, uh, which uh, led him past uh, McGill University for one year, uh, Virginia Tech for about eight years, and then most notably as uh, founder and head of the Department of Statistics of Florida State University from 1959 to 1978. Uh, he served uh, on the faculty at the University of Georgia from 1982 to 1992. Uh, and he has a very impressive list of contributions to the profession, uh, including many roles within the ASA, the IMS, the International Biomedical Society, and the ISI, and including as president of the ASA in 1981. He also has an impressive list of uh, research papers. He wrote more than 110 research papers in a variety of different areas, including design of experiments, non-parametric statistics, sequential analysis, and multivariate analysis. Uh, he passed away in October uh, of 2001. The Bradley Lecture has been uh, in place since 1993, and we have seen an impressive list of uh, speakers, uh, C.R. Rao, Peter Bickel, Jai Ram Saturama, uh, H.A. David, Brad Efron, Ron Pike, Miles Hollander, Ron Randalls, Dick Schaefer, Robert Hogg, George Casella, Jim Berger, Bruce Lindsay, Ray Carroll, Charlie Meng, Jayanta Ghosh, Nancy Reed, Steve Merrin, and Peter McCullough. I'm very happy today that we can add another impressive list, impressive name to this list, namely the name of uh, Dennis Kirk, our speaker today. Uh, Dennis received his uh, bachelor's in mathematics from Northern Monta Montana College, and he holds an MS and PhD in statistics from Kansas State University, receiving a PhD in 1971. Uh, since that time, he has, has held positions in statistics at the University of Minnesota, uh, including as full professor since 1981, and as chair of the Department of Applied Statistics from 1980 through 1990. He has a long list of honors and awards, and I'll just mention a few. Uh, he's an elected fellow of the ASA, 1982. He's an elected fellow of IMS, 1987. He's a three-time winner of the Jack Uden Prize for Best Expository Paper in Technometrics. He's also a winner of the Frank Wilkinson Award for Best Technical Paper in Technometrics. He was a 2005 uh, Fisher Award winner. Uh, and he held a 2008 uh, Microsoft and e EPSRC sponsored visiting fellowship at the Isaac Newton Institute for Mathematical Sciences in Cambridge. He served uh, discipline in a variety of uh, positions, including as associate editor for JASA multiple times, for Biometrica, for JISSB, and for Statistica Sinica. His research interests span a wide variety of, of areas, including dimension reduction, regression diagnostics and graphics, design of experiments, and also applications in bioinformatics. He has a large number of publications, and his research has constantly been, been funded by the National Science Foundation. He is also the author of multiple books on aspects of regression, including diagnostics, computing, and graphics. And everybody of you probably has heard about Cook's distance, which is named after him. Uh, he has about 30 PhD students, and I, if, if I would give you a list of, of these PhD students, you would recognize many of them. Uh, but most notably, I think you would recognize our own uh, Jean Mounier. <laughs> so the title of today's talk is uh, Envelope Models and Methods. So without further ado, Dennis, it's yours. Thank you, John, for that lovely introduction. Occasionally, if I break attention during an introduction like that and I come back, I wonder who they're talking about. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to be here to give the, the Bradley Lecture to uh, renew old friendships and perhaps to make some new friends. I, I actually knew Ralph Bradley, uh, not well, but uh, he tried to recruit 
my first PhD student to Florida when he was there. And things didn't work out so well and the student went to Harvard instead. But Ralph never sort of forgave me for that. <laughs> uh, John mentioned that Ralph has a, had a 110, I think you said, papers. Uh, for, the, for the students in the crowd that are used to working with tech and generating papers relatively easily, 110 is a lot because you wrote out everything by hand, uh, gave it to a secretary, the secretary gave it back to you, you uh, made the corrections. There could be four or five iterations with the secretary before you finally got a manuscript that you were happy with, and all of that could easily take six weeks to eight weeks, depending on how many people managed to get their papers in in front of you while you were correcting yours. So, uh, publication back then was a bit more laborious. Well, today we're going to talk about envelope models and methods, and this is really annoying. I'm going to try and move it a little bit. Yeah. Today we're going to talk about uh, envelope models and methods. The, the basic idea behind envelopes is to improve efficiency in multivariate statistical uh, problems. You can use it in a variety of problems, uh, and we're going to think primarily eventually about the uh, multivariate linear model. Uh, the original idea for envelopes I, I published with Ming Lee and Francesca Charmonti in 2010 we're still learning about these things and we're still figuring out what they can be used for and I'm still more and more impressed with what you can do with them. So I'm going to be spending most of this talk on an introduction to envelope models. Uh, later on we'll talk a little bit about recent developments, partial envelopes, and you can read this there for yourselves. But I will primarily stay with the introduction I expect. So let's consider the multivariate linear model. Uh, for the students in the class, if you've taken a class in multivariate, I expect that you've seen the multivariate linear model. This model is intended to be exactly as you have seen it uh, in your coursework. So let's run through the items just to make sure we're on the same page. Uh, y is a multivariate response vector, so we have n observations on a multivariate response vector. X is a non-stochastic vector of predictors that we assume without loss of generality is centered at zero. Epsilon is a vector of normal errors with mean zero and covariance matrix uh, sigma. The assumption of normal errors here is not crucial for what I'm doing, but for an introduction to envelope models using the assumption of normality gives, I think, a rather crisp introduction that's uh, easier to grasp at the first pass than if we abandon normality with all of the uh, subsequent complications. Nevertheless, a little bit later, I will be telling you how things play out with non-normality. But just remember that non-normality is not in any sense essential, but it's nice for a first glance. And I'm assuming that none of you have heard about envelopes. Uh, alpha is the unknown intercept vector. Beta is the unknown matrix of coefficients. And our goal is to estimate beta as well as we can. This model has been studied over and over and over again since the 1920s. And it's amazing that anyone could find anything new to say about this model. Nevertheless, I think that what I'm going to have to say does play out in a certain novel, novel way. So to, to understand our take on this model, let's consider the response vector. And let's imagine that some linear combinations of the response vector do not respond to changes in the predictor change the predictors, some linear combinations of the response vector are distributionally static. Their distribution does not change as you change the predictors. And that requirement comes in two aspects. That distribution of those linear combinations can't change marginally, and they also must be independent of the other linear combinations. So you can't be losing any, those linear combinations won't furnish any information either directly or indirectly through other linear combinations. Now, if you imagine that scenario, then what happens is those linear combinations of Y are, in effect, irrelevant for the purpose of estimating beta. On the other hand, they can bring a lot of extraneous variation to the estimation of beta. That means if we can somehow identify those kinds of linear combinations and properly set them aside during estimation, we can drastically improve the efficiency of the estimate of beta. Uh, let's try and put some symbols to those ideas. 
So we're going to let gamma and gamma zero be an orthogonal matrix. We're going to think of gamma transpose y as being the material part of y. That's the part of y that responds to changes in x. We're going to think of gamma zero transpose at y as the immaterial part of y. That's the part of y that doesn't respond to changes in x. And it doesn't respond in the following way that the distribution of gamma zero transpose y given x is exactly the same as the distribution without conditioning on x. So there's no effect of x on the distribution of that linear combination. Similarly, gamma zero transpose y has got to be independent of gamma transpose y given x. So there can be no leakage of information from, from the material part to the immaterial part. Now, if you have those two conditions holding, uh, then we're going to let B be the span of beta, so it's the subspace spanned by the columns of beta. In this particular case, gamma is not identified, so don't think we're going to estimate gamma. If you think of the driving equations just below point number two, if I multiply gamma on the uh, right by any orthogonal matrix, those equations are true if and only if the transformed equations are true. So there's no way we can identify gamma, but we can identify the span of gamma. And it's the span of gamma that we call the envelope. Now why we call it the envelope isn't intended to be clear from this particular slide, uh, but hopefully it will become clear as we go along. This is just a first introduction or first look at how things work. Uh, nor does this slide give you a proper definition of an envelope, but it's again a first look at how things operate then the span of gamma zero is the span of, is the orthogonal complement of the envelope. So this, in as short a slide as I can muster, is the basic idea behind what we're doing. So now, keeping this in mind, let's think of a simple problem. So here we have a multivariate problem with two responses, y1 and y2. So r is equal to 2 in this case. The predictor is binary. It takes on a value x equal to 0 and x equal to 1. So you can imagine that you're doing an experiment and x equal to 0 means untreated, x equal to 1 means treated, and you're measuring on each experimental unit two responses. The only reason I'm using two responses and a binary predictor here is because I can draw graphs easily. So now imagine this kind of scenario, and before we go to envelopes, Let's imagine how a standard analysis would work. Now what we're going to do is we're going to consider the, comparing the means on the horizontal response on the y2 response. So our goal for the purpose of this plot is going to be to compare the population means on y2. The standard analysis under the model that I had would do the following. It would take each sample from those two populations and it would project it down onto the horizontal axis. Now, if you imagine projecting many data points down onto the horizontal axis, you'll get curves that look something like that. Those curves overlap quite a bit, and it's going to take you a pretty large sample size to be able to tell that the population means differ on the y2 variable. Okay? They do differ, you can see it in the plot, but nevertheless, the way the variation is arranged it's going to take a large sample size. And for students in the crowd, you would do the test on the horizontal axis using just a usual two-sample t-test. Right, so there's, there's nothing different here so far than, than probably what you've seen in your classes. On the other hand, envelopes work differently. So let's do the same problem and now see how an envelope would behave. I've marked on this graph the envelope and its orthogonal complement. Now remember the two conditions for, for the envelope. We have to have the distribution of gamma zero transpose x independent of x. If you think of the two populations, imagine projecting them onto the orthogonal complement of the envelope. Okay? The orthogonal complement of the envelope is there, it runs in this direction. You can see it here. It runs in this direction. If you project the two populations onto that envelope, onto the orthogonal complement, they're going to be exactly the same. 
the distribution doesn't depend on X when projected onto the orthogonal component of the envelope. Correspondingly, if you condition on X, thinking within each population, you can imagine, I hope, that the envelope again and its orthogonal complement are independent. So that's the key observation, that the way those things are arranged, anything that happens in the direction of the orthogonal complement is irrelevant to the estimation of beta. You with me? Okay. Now, how does an envelope analysis work? An envelope analysis works according, this is how the likelihood plays out. An envelope analysis works by taking each data point, you'll have data points from both, from, uh, both populations. It takes a data point and instead of projecting it directly down onto the horizontal axis, it first projects it onto the envelope. Use following path B. So if you look at path B in the plot, the point is first projected or onto the envelope and then it's projected down onto the horizontal axis. And that's because all the action is taking place within the envelope. So it projects parallel to the orthogonal complement of the envelope, onto the envelope, then down to the horizontal axis. Now imagine doing that with a large number of points. You get two distributions that look like that. Those distributions are well separated. Your standard errors based on an envelope analysis will be much, much smaller than the standard errors based on the usual analysis for the reasons that are implicit in that graph that you're looking at. So if you can find, an find the envelope, project down onto it, and then follow whatever objective you want to in the analysis, you're bound to get much smaller standard errors in situations depicted in this graph. Now, in practice, you aren't going to know the envelope, so you're going to have to estimate it. You will estimate it via maximum likelihood. What that causes is that causes a certain degree of wobble in the envelope, and that wobble will be transformed down or transferred down to the distributions and make them spread a little bit more than is illustrated here. But that spread, that additional spread, is still much, much less than what we saw doing the usual analysis. So you'll still gain, or could still gain, massively. Let's look at a simple example. This is a data set of wheat protein data. Y1 and Y2 are spectral intensities of two wavelengths for a high and low protein content wheat. There are 50 observations, about 25 high protein content, 25 low protein content. So the horizontal and vertical axes are the spectral intensities at the two wavelengths. Let's suppose we wanted to compare uh, spectral intensities at each wavelength for against uh, protein content populations. The standard analysis, the standard estimators, have standard errors given at the bottom. For the, for the two coefficients of beta, they're 8.6 and 9.5. Those are just the standard errors of the difference between two population means. Every, you know how to compute that. It's trivial. You learned that in the first course in statistics. On the other hand, the envelope estimator has standard errors 0.4 and 0.6, massively smaller than the usual ones. To appreciate how much smaller the standard errors are, we could ask ourselves the following question. Suppose I was going to do a standard analysis, not an envelope analysis. What kind of sample size would I have to generate in my standard analysis to achieve the standard errors that are displayed there in the envelope analysis? The answer is you'd have to have a sample size of about 20,000. With a sample size of 20,000, 10,000 from each of the two populations, and doing a standard analysis, you'd come up with standard errors of about 0.6 and 0.4. So in effect, we've gotten an efficiency increase that's incredibly massive in this particular case. So now let's come back to the, uh, incidentally if there are questions as I go along, uh, please feel free to ask. Let's now come back to the driving statements for the envelope. This is a review of the previous slide. So we have gamma transpose y, gamma zero transpose y, and the two requirements that are listed on the slide. Now the question arises, uh, how do these things play out in terms of the model? We started off with the regular linear model. If I take these conditions and incorporate them in the multivariate linear model, what does the resulting model look like? 
Well, here's now a formal definition of the envelope and how it plays out. We begin with the model under point number one. That's the one we saw before. We have to choose gamma so that it contains, so that the span of gamma contains the span of beta. That's one requirement on gamma. It must, its span must contain the span of beta. So we can always write beta as gamma times a coordinate vector or a coordinate matrix eta. Right? That's a requirement for the conditions that we saw before. In addition, sigma has to be decomposable in the way indicated there. We have to be able to decompose sigma into its projection onto the envelope and the orthogonal column. Now, it turns out that that requirement, uh, that decomposition requirement, is a necessary and sufficient condition for the span of gamma for the envelope to be a reducing subspace of sigma. And to remind you, under definition one, I have a reminder about what a reducing subspace is. R is a reducing subspace of M if uh, MR is contained in R and MR curve is contained in R. Yes? What do you see on the Oh, sigma is the covariance matrix of the errors in the linear model. Uh, yeah, that was several slides back. I should have put a reminder on this. Anything else? So we have a multivariate linear model, the one displayed at the top. The errors are r by 1 vectors, and sigma is their covariance matrix. So sigma is a r by r covariance matrix of the errors. Standard multivariate linear model. Now, there could be several gammas that satisfy the necessary uh, conditions under points 1 and points 2 and 3 at the top of the slide. To make that unique, we define the sigma envelope of beta, represented by the symbols that we've already looked at. We define that as the intersection of all reducing subspaces of sigma that contain beta. Now the reason for calling it an envelope. We're trying to envelop the span of beta with the reducing subspaces of sigma. So we want to get the smallest a uh, set of reducing subspaces of sigma that contains the span of beta. And so in that sense, we're enveloping the span of beta, and that's why we call it an envelope. And there's a characterization uh, for envelopes at the bottom of the slide. You can characterize an envelope as the subspace sum of the projections of uh, the span of beta onto the eigenspaces of sigma. So when we take those ideas and we incorporate them in the model, we end up with a version of the multivariate linear model that's displayed here. So y is then alpha plus gamma eta x, and sigma is sigma 1 plus sigma 2, and its decomposition is indicated there. So beta is gamma eta, the span of gamma is the envelope, u is the dimension of the envelope, and omega 1, and, excuse me, omega and omega 0 are just positive definite matrices with the appropriate definition of dimensions that have to be estimated. So starting with the multivariate linear model then, through the motivation I've mentioned, we end up with the model that's indicated there. The sigma 1 and sigma 2 we think of as the material variation, that's the variation in the material part of y, and sigma 2 as the immaterial variation, that's the variation in the immaterial part of y. So now, once we have a likelihood, once we have a model with normal errors, we write down the likelihood function and we go to work maximizing. Now, when we do that, it turns out that estimating the envelope leads us into a new kind of computational problem, a computational problem that's fairly well known in, in computer science, but is not nearly as well known in statistics. So to estimate the envelope, this is the maximum likelihood estimator. What we have to do is minimize over all subspaces, all us, our dimensional subspace, u dimensional subspaces in RR, of the objective function indicated there. Now, PS represents the projection onto a subspace S. Uh, QS represents a projection onto its orthogonal complement. Uh, the zero outside the usual determinant side means we take the product of only the non-zero eigenvalues. 
that matrix. Uh, sigma hat resid is the residual covariance matrix from the fit of the usual linear model uh, without the envelope structure, and sigma hat y is the marginal covariance matrix of y, the estimate of the marginal covariance matrix of y. Uh, once you uh, optimize that objective function, the rest of the parameters are estimated very easily in the manner indicated there. And I'll just mention one, beta hat, the envelope estimator of beta, is, take, is obtained by taking the usual estimator of beta, here I've called it beta hat OLS, and projecting it down onto the estimator of envelope, which is exactly what we saw in that little graphic that I showed you. I'm not going to talk much about estimating uh, U because U is estimated using traditional uh, methods like likelihood ratio testing, AIC, BIC, whatever. So here are a couple of results. Uh, the envelope estimator is always more efficient than or as efficient as the standard estimator asymptotically, so asymptotically we lose nothing and we could gain a lot. When do we gain a lot? We gain a lot when the norm, think of Think of the norms under the remark as the spectral norms. When the spectral norm of the material variation is a lot less than the spectral norm of the immaterial variation. So if you've got a lot of immaterial variation in your problem, you can gain massive. So here's another example. This one consists cons is the heights of boys and girls. And those boys and girls happen to be three of my grandchildren. Uh, so this is, this is part of a study to uh, follow boys and girls over time and measure them on various characteristics each year. So remember the motivating picture that we had. So here is the heights of boys and girls. Boys are blue, girls are red at ages 13 and 14. Now, suppose we wanted to compare the heights of boys and girls at age 13 and age 14. Because the norm of the, of the material variation is a lot less than the norm of the material variation, we would expect massive gains. And in fact, we, get, we do get massive gains. The standard error ratios, the standard error for the standard model and for the standard estimators and the envelope estimators, those ratios are 8.49 and 8.66. Again, we get really massive gains in the standard errors. And you can see why that data follows exactly the same pattern as the uh, motivating plot that we showed you before. Now, there are other ways things can happen. Suppose that our two populations look like this. So the projections that we use are projections A and B. Now, in this case, the immaterial variation is small relative to the material variation. All the important variation runs this way along the plot, the immaterial variation runs this way. And because of that, when you look at the two projections on lines A and B, they're very close. Now in this case, we would still gain asymptotically, but the gain wouldn't be much at all. So there's our heights of boys and girls at ages 17 and 18. They follow a pattern exactly like the previous schematic I showed you. The material variation has, is uh, 0.16, it's norm. The material variation has norm 118.7, and the standard error ratios are virtually one. So here you gain nothing. But asymptotically, you're also guaranteed not to lose anything. So the situation here is, for, the, for this kind of analysis, is in some cases, you're going to gain massively with envelopes, and in other cases, there's going to be very little gain, and you don't really need them. That's a common kind of situation in statistics. Think of simple linear regression. Occasionally, we will add quadratic or polynomial terms, and we will get a large benefit to our analysis. But we don't always need to do that. In some cases, a simple linear regression model is all that's needed. So it's like that. In some cases, an envelope isn't always needed. It doesn't always give you gains, but asymptotically, Actually, I did apply this uh, in, in some of my applications with my clients. Uh, there were a couple of the clients that found it very interesting that I could assure them that every single linear combination of Y responded to X. And there were some linear combinations that were, in effect, deadly in his measurements. Uh, 
Uh, you can always stu also study the standard errors by using Bootstrap. And here is the uh, here are various standard errors using the Bootstrap, the envelope model, and the standard model. And you can see that the Bootstrap gives a really good uh, in this case uh, uh, gives a really good uh, representation of the asymptotic results. So you, in small samples, if you're worried about the accuracy of the asymptotic results, you can simply apply the Bootstrap in a standard way and uh, and uh, use it in the standard. Here's another example. This is an example of uh, New Zealand mussels. The response variable consists of the logarithms of shell height, shell width, shell length, shell mass, and uh, two more muscle mass and viscera mass. X is the, again, binary. It's the presence or absence of pea crabs living in the mussel shell. So the idea here is to see if there's any difference in the physical characteristics of a muscle, depending on whether or not there's a pea crab living in the shell. On the right of your screen, you see a picture of a pea crab, and on the left, you see a picture of a mussel. Uh, in this case, U hat was in, U was inferred to be one. Uh, the material variation is about 1.19. The immaterial variation is 0 0.07. So we don't expect any gain here by using envelopes, and the answer is we don't get any gain. The standard error ratios are about one again. On the other hand. If we look at some air pollution data for Los Angeles, uh, 42 measurements at noon, measurements on carbon monoxide, uh, uh, nit uh, dioxides, ozone, and uh, hydrocarbons, the X variable now is, uh, is continuous. It's wind speed and solar radiation, so that there are two predictors. And in this case, again, we get U hat equal to 1. The material variation is small. The immaterial variation is large and we get massive, massive gains in this particular example. So what I'm trying to do here is create an impression that you don't always get massive gains. When you get massive gains, they're really, really big. Here are the individual standard error ratios. Yes? Whoops, I went the wrong way. Yes, there's a, there's a, a time dependent. Well, I don't know if there's a time dependence. Um, time was not modeled in this particular case. There are the individual standard error ratios, and you can see that for each of the response variables, the improvements are pretty much constant uh, on the two, the two predictions. So now we come to non-normality. I promised you at the beginning that I talked a little bit about how non-normality plays out. Uh, the motivation is since we don't have normal errors, we're going to replace the conditional independence with the covariance condition. So we just replace independence with zero covariance. The definition of the envelope involves only the first two moments. So as far as the definition of the envelope is concerned, there's no problem. That extends immediately. That has absolutely nothing to do with normality. It involves only two moments. So you have to have two moments existing. Uh, we're going to estimate, if we have non-normality, we're going to estimate using exactly the same objective function we did before, except we're not going to assume normality. So this means that we're going to lose optimality relative to a likelihood solution, but nevertheless, we can still study the, uh, study the estimator in the usual way. And it turns out that the estimators are root n consistent and they converge to a normal random. Uh, beta hat, the envelope estimator, can still dominate the usual estimator, which is probably the one you would use for normality anyway, in the same way and for exactly the same reasons. And we use the bootstrap again to find standard errors in small samples. So with non-normality, there is in fact no difference. It's just you can't be as strict in the original conditions and use independence. You relax that condition and require zero or uncorrelated uh, characteristics, and then you do the Kinds of things. So non-normality is not an issue at all. Uh, any questions at this point? So you mentioned k loss is more than sigma two. So does the mouse sigma two uh depending on the utilization of gamma? Yes. Gamma is small and the mutation? Not necessarily. The dimension of gamma is pretty much irrelevant. 
what it depends on is the relative sizes of the material and immaterial variation. So gamma, gamma has to have dimension r. You have to have some reduction. But it doesn't matter if there's a lot of reduction or just a little reduction. It depends on the sizes of the immaterial and material variation. I'll show an example in a minute where uh, u hat is equal to 6. And I think there are 8 predictors. And we still get massive changes. So here's, here's a first extension. And I'm going to, I'll spend a little time on this extension and then the other extensions I'll, I'll just mention briefly. Uh, in some cases, in, in some multigrade analyses, some of the predictors might be of special interest. For example, we might have X1 might be a treatment, and X2 is included uh, only to reduce variation. In that case, what we're interested in is estimating as well as we can beta 1, and we don't really care so much about beta 2 because that's a, that's a variance reduction device. So the, the issue now is can we envelop just beta 1 and ignore beta 2? And the answer is yes, we can, and we proceed in pretty much exactly the same way. So after we write down all the equations and do everything in the same way, we get a model that looks pretty much identical to the one we had before, except there's a beta 2 translose x sitting there because we've not tried to envelop beta 2 with beta 1. We've left beta 2 alone. That represents, again, just variance reduction. Our focus is on beta 1. Uh, the, what turns out is, is kind of interesting here that uh, the envelope model in practice is simply applied to the residuals, the model for the residuals of the regression of y on x2 on the residuals of the regression of y1 on x2. Just exactly like an added variable plot. So you simply use the added variable plot structure to uh, generate a working model, and then you apply envelopes as if you were doing it to the full beta vector. Only in this case, the full beta vector is just beta 1. So here's a few more details. I know some of you might like to see some details. Uh, so we'll, so, yeah. What time should I wrap up, John? Uh, about 20 minutes or so. Okay, I'll be, I'll be done well before that. So here we have, again, optimization for the Graspin manifold. We again end up with the Graspin manifold. There, the envelope model, the optimization problem is indicated at the bottom of the slide. The point that I'm trying to make here is that when you consider the partial envelopes, so you're enveloping only part of beta, it pretty much plays out in exactly the same way as the full envelope model. So you're not confined to enveloping the full beta, but you can do it all partial beta. Here's just a look at asymptotic variances. Uh, beta half 1 converges to a normal random variable with mean you know, indicated there, with mean 0, and covariance matrix that's uh, given by V1, and it's kind of a complicated expression sitting in the middle of the slide. I do want to say a couple of things about this expression, though, because it gives some kind of intuition into what happens with the asymptotic variance. This first term is the asymptotic variance of the estimator if you knew the basis for the envelope. So if you knew the envelope, that would be the asymptotic variance. The second term is the price you pay for estimating the envelope. So if you remember back, I said, if you knew the envelope, you get these distributions. If not, there's going to be some wobble in the envelope. That second term represents the wobble in the envelope. And if your sample size is at all reasonable, it's usually quite small. And you don't really pay a serious price uh, unless your sample size is small or there's very, very little. So there's where we were. Thank you. There's where we were just talking a little bit about asymptotic variances. Uh, the proposition a uh, partial envelope estimator is always more efficient than or as efficient as the standard estimator asymptotically. So we're coming up with the same sorts of results that we get for the full envelope estimator. So here's an example. This is an example on uh, paper fiber. The response now is uh, for uh, paper properties breaking strength, elastic modulus, stress to failure, and burst strength. 
and x is three fiber properties, the arithmetic fiber length, the long fiber fraction, and the fine fiber fraction. So we have r of three, we have three responses, and we have three predictors. The envelope model, we inferred uh, u is equal to two. The uh, material variation has relative size, four, or size 4.95, immaterial 1.01, .01, and there's no difference again in the standard errors, essentially. Now that's if we fit the full envelope model. On the other hand, if we chose to focus on one of the predictors, fine fiber fraction, so now we're enveloping only one of the predictors, then what we find is a u equal to one, the dimension of the envelope is equal to one. But now, the material variation is a lot smaller than the immaterial variation, and we gain massively again in terms of the standard errors. We gain a lot. Uh, the standard error ratio is being 6.8 to 63.6. We've also looked at other, other extensions. We have an extension for heteroscedastic error structures, so you don't have the same variance in the two distributions represented by this. And the pattern, again, is the same. You can see the two projections. Everything plays out in the same way. The asymptotics are different. The calculations tend to be more complicated. But the basic idea plays out the same way. Scaling. Oops. There. Uh, there's also an extension to scale envelope models. If you have a case where it doesn't appear that uh, the envelope is doing you any good, sometimes you can simply rescale one of the variables bring things back into line, and again, get massive gains by inefficiency. So I think I'm going to wrap up now by making a few final comments. We'll leave you time for questions at the end. So we have We've been talking about envelope applications in the context of the multivariate linear method. But it turns out that envelopes seem to go everywhere in multivariate analysis. And in particular, we've recently completed a study on envelopes and partial least squares. It turns out that partial least squares, that methodology, partial least squares regression, has as its nucleus an envelope. We were able to show that partial least squares multivariate partial least squares, is at its core trying to estimate an envelope. That's what drives it. It's trying to estimate an envelope exactly as defined here. And it's estimating that envelope with, as it turns out, quite a crude moment estimator. If you pit partial least squares against the envelope estimators that we've been talking about here, uh, we do much, much better in virtually every situation you could think of. Now, the situation is different there because for partial least squares, partial least squares focuses mainly on reduction in the predictors, not in the response. So here we would be applying uh, envelope methodology to the predictors, not the response. But nevertheless, the ideas are all the same. Everything plays out the same way. And it turns out, I was surprised, that's why I'm dwelling on this. And it turns out that partial least squares is, in fact, envelope methodology that uses crude moment estimators, uses crude moment matching to get an estimate of the envelope. If you use more intelligent estimates of the envelope, you in fact do much better in both prediction and estimation. Uh, other places where we might think about think about envelope problems, uh, large n's, uh, small n, large p problems. We haven't really tackled those yet. I think there's a role for, uh, for envelopes and dimension reduction generally, but again, we haven't tackled that. Uh, classification for functional data. Here we come back to partial least squares, because in a couple of recent papers, uh, Peter Hall and his co-authors argued and spoke strongly that uh, partial least squares regression does really, really well when attempting to classify functional data. Now, partial least squares does well when classifying functional data. And partial least squares is at its core an envelope method. And we should be able to do better classifying functional data if we replace partial least squares with 
proper uh, functional envelope methodology. Uh, Nonlinear regression, that's another way where, place where uh, envelopes can be applied. Principal component analysis, uh, it turns out that there are envelope extensions of principal components. So you can take principal component analyses and instead of uh, using the usual kind of analysis, you can extend that using envelope ideas and get uh, what you could call a principal envelope analysis or principal envelope components. But extend principal components and reduce the principal components in certain very, very special cases. So you do the same kind of reduction that you would do with the principal component analysis, except you're using an envelope story. And with that, I think we'll focus. choosing important um, portion of y side um, that's necessarily related to x. And I was wondering if there's any intrinsic um, connection to the canonical, canonical correlation analysis. If you run canonical correlation analysis and if you remove the first few canonical directions out of the subspace spent by y vectors, and then the rest of the dimensions are going to be the immaterial part of the sigma. You would found a part, uh, first of all, of subspace um, to the, uh, sp the space made by the first few canonical vectors of Y. Right. The, if you, am I coming through? If you did a canonical correlation analysis, it would play out just as you said, but you wouldn't get the estimates of the coefficients. And the canonical correlation analysis doesn't directly estimate an envelope. It, you start off with getting most correlated linear combinations but there's no sense in which you're trying to envelop anything. So a an, uh, canonical correlation can't possibly uh, repeat what an envelope analysis does, because an envelope analysis requires two things. It requires what you're trying to envelop and what you're trying to envelop it with. And in a con canonical correlation analysis, you don't have the first object. So there's no notion of what you're trying to envelop. You're simply trying to think of basically two sets of variables and get most correlated linear combinations. Okay. Okay. Question along those lines, but it's a different question. Um, since the methodology of material and material, um, uh, you had y on one side, x on the other side. Uh, it looks to me, uh, it would be a good thesis problem to look at both y and x having immaterial parts and uh, try to develop some sort of a canonical analysis uh, with that. Yeah, I agree completely. I have a PhD student doing that now. Oh, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Too late. Yeah, I, no, I, agree, I agree completely. That's an important problem because what we've done is what I've showed you is reduction of y. If you reduce x alone, you end up with something that's, that's better than uh, partially squares. It's what partially squares is going to be. But now if you reduce both x and y simultaneously, what do you get? The answer is, I don't know. But I really think it's an interesting problem. My second question was, what if you were to sort of uh, assume that the epsilon is not necessarily multivariate normal, probably 95% of the time multivariate normal plus some T distribution or whatever, something heavy tail, and how does it impact the eventual estimate of beta hat? Uh, the, the careful answer is I don't know. My expectation is that it would mess it up a lot. And you would need to do that properly. You'd need to replace the maximum likelihood estimator or OLS estimators that I was using with a robust version. Uh, but I expect if you did that properly, you would end up coming up with the same results. But yeah, if you throw a little contamination in, a little bias in the air, stick some heavy tails on, uh, then my expectation is you're not going to gain much because the envelopes would be really messed up by the few online points that are scattered on. So following that, um, suppose you know that 
we were too uh, too close to so the gain is very much less, you know. Then you can try to do variable transformation, so make sure that the y two part you know, the sigma two part is getting bigger, sigma one part is getting smaller, that right? will work or not. I'm not sure what you're no, you, you have this problem, you calculate sigma one, sigma two, the gain is the ratio is maybe close to one, right? So you now have a sigma one part, sigma two part. Now you do the variable transformation for y one, y two. So so try to make the uh, the variance for the sigma one part smaller, sigma two part bigger. Does that help? I'm not sure. Uh, I see your point, but I haven't thought about it before. No, actually, I don't think that would help because you could have two things happening. If you tried to mix, if you mix the sigma one and sigma two part, you could end up changing the envelope structure. And if you left them alone and transformed them within themselves, it won't affect anyone. On the other hand, if you did that, I'm thinking as I'm. The, re the short answer is I don't know. Other questions? If not, then let's uh, thank Steve one more time.